Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. So welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am, of course, your host, Chris Martinson. And today, we're speaking with Robert Rapier, the Chief Technology Officer and Executive Vice President for America International, a Hawaii-based renewable energy company. America's core focus is on the localized use of biomass to energy for the benefit of local populations. In addition to his work there, Robert speaks about the intersection of energy and the environment, and I've come to know him through our shared participation at ASPO, the Association for the Study of Peak Oil and Gas, where we had the pleasure of uh, co-presenting on, on a panel uh, this past year. He has deep engineering expertise I respect tremendously, uh, notably in cellulosic ethanol, butanol production, oil refining, natural gas production, gas to liquids. He's also currently planning a book detailing present and future energy options in a resource-constrained world. Robert, hey, pleasure to speak with you today. Pleasure to be here, Chris. Well, you know, um, while we were at ASPO together, you had a very interesting presentation on how to perform due diligence on alternative energy companies uh, that I really uh, I really enjoyed a lot and I would like to bring to our listeners today. Um, and the reason is, is that there are many out there who pin their hopes on a disruption-free future to the idea that we will transition from oil to something else. You know, perhaps they've heard of a lab somewhere that has uh, made biodiesel from algae at twice the output efficiency of, of past efforts. I get emails from people all the time telling me of some great lab discovery or other. Um, or, or perhaps they've heard that solar or wind has a high net energy return, could easily replace oil if we ever decided to get serious about that, make the switch. I want to have a discussion with you about how realistic these ideas and hopes are given your experience in analyzing the actual companies that are behind these claims um, with the intent of putting real money to work on real efforts. That's what you do. You're lining up opportunities and money. So uh, I guess that means a higher level of rigor has been applied than exists in your typical PR release or, or a news article uh, as what we find in your efforts. So uh, if we could, let's begin with the story you told about an energy magazine that recently asked you to rank the 50 best alternative energy companies We'll go from there. Right. Um, yeah. So the request came in. Uh, there's a there's a, um, a a magazine online magazine. I won't say who it is because they uh, I, I don't know that they want their voters to be to be known. But um, they ask to rank the top fifty uh, companies in renewable energy, and they asked me to vote this year. And I had a list of a couple of hundred companies from them, and as I started to sort the list. Once I got past about a top five, it became really iffy. And I mean, if by iffy, I mean I'm not sure these companies will exist in 10 years. Because what I'm looking for when I'm ranking one of these companies is I think that it can actually go head-to-head -head and compete with oil uh, at some higher oil price. So uh, that means that the embedded oil in the production of that biofuel has to be low, because if it's not, then it won't be competitive as oil prices get higher. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has to it, it has to be ultimately cost competitive. So maybe it costs a hundred dollars a barrel to produce, but if the if it has low oil inputs, then I think that is a company that could hang around. But so many of these companies, I think they've made so many false claims, and and some of them I'm I'm very sure won't be in business in ten years. So it got very hard beyond about five to really rank companies. And and by the time I'm ten, I'm I'm ranking companies that. I'm sure are not going to be around. I mean, some of these companies I know will not be around, and I don't think they have a very good business model. So it becomes very difficult in the renewable energy sphere to find some of these companies. Maybe, I mean, my focus is biomass and, and biofuels mostly. So maybe in the wind sector, maybe in the solar sector, there are, um, and, and I think solar is, is actually a, a good example of something that's that's coming on and doing pretty well. Uh, but in the biofuel sector, there's not a lot uh, to choose from there that, that you could really say this company is going to be in for the long haul. Well, it's the biofuels that, that I'm most interested in because at, at present, it, as exciting as wind or solar may be, we still do not have even a fraction of a percent of our transportation infrastructure running on electricity. So so of the things where we can get liquid fuels, I'm glad that's where your expertise is. Let, let's begin then. So you're ranking these companies, and, and first you're doing some sort of a financial due diligence, and you're saying, look, if they have high embedded oil costs in them and they're not competitive with oil 
right now, as oil goes up, they'll still not be competitive with oil in the future. It's probably you know just some some sort of a, a receding horizons uh, dynamic at work there. Exactly. But what what are some of the other reasons that that you don't think these some of these companies will be around? Well, I mean, whenever you when you think about what oil is, then you understand why these biofuels companies have a tough time of making it work. I mean, oil is the accumulation of billions, I mean, millions, millions of years of biomass that have accumulated, and then nature has applied the pressure, it's applied the heat, and it has cooked these into very dense, energy-dense hydrocarbons. Now, what we're trying to do in real time is speed all this up. Somebody has to plant the biomass, somebody has to grow the biomass, where nature did it in the first place. We have to transport it, we have to bring it into a factory, we have to get it in a form uh, we have to convert it from biomass into some fuel. We're adding energy and labor inputs all along. And then finally we get a fuel out of the back end. And a lot of the times, a lot of these so-called biofuels are very heavily dependent on fossil fuels to begin with. So uh, some of them it's not even clear that they'd be viable if you took the fossil fuels out of the process. But when you think about all the labor and energy that goes into making a biofuel from an annual crop, it becomes apparent why oil has been the dominant fuel for the last 150 years. It just it's it's much easier to to go poke a hole in the ground and get that oil out of the ground than it is to go through all the labor of actually producing the fuel. So um, companies are competing against that. Now there are some cases where like sugarcane ethanol is a good uh, poster child for something that competes head to head with oil most of the time. Uh, but it's got some very special things going for it. It's uh, largely grown in tropical climates, so you've got year-round sun. Uh, the bag ass that's produced when you harvest sugarcane ends up at the plant. It's washed, it's, it's dried, and it's there, piled up in big piles, and so essentially they have free energy. So um, sugarcane ethanol historically has has been able to compete on price with gasoline. Now right now it's a little bit different because uh, uh, there's a bit of a sugar shortage and so the the sugarcane ethanol prices are high. But that's that's an example and and the biggest reason is the fossil fuel inputs into that process are are very low. Um, most of the guys that I think will fail are is because they're making bad assumptions. So uh, looking forward, they will assume a and, and most of the guys that are predicting a dollar biofuel or, or two dollar biofuel are making assumptions on the cost of their biomass, which I don't think will be very good. And often that assumption is we will get tipping fees to take this biomass. And that assumption comes up frequently very early in the process before they've even had a chance to test on that particular feedstock uh, or pilot on that particular feedstock. You come up with a business plan and you say, if I assume somebody's going to pay me $70 a ton to take this biomass, well, suddenly that offsets the cost of your fuel by a great deal. There may be absolutely no merit to the assumption that you just made, but uh, that assumption will drive those costs down. And historically, there's uh, the the example that I gave at uh, the ASPO conference was a company called Changing World Technologies, and they were in Discover Magazine in 2003, and they were very, very much hyped. Uh, they said they could t- turn any waste product imaginable into oil. Mm-hmm. Um, they talked about this being the the solution to our energy problems, and they predicted that they produced the oil for eight to twelve dollars a barrel. And this was featured in Discover Magazine before they ever even built a demonstration plant. Huh. And it got very little critical examination. You had uh, Warren Buffett's son, Howard Buffett, was invested in it, so they had that piece of credibility out there. Um, you know, he, obviously, he must know what he's doing. So the, the hype was on this company to deliver, and once they built the plant, they could not deliver. Um, the worst assumption they made is, they thought they were going to get paid to take the biomass, and they ended up having to pay for it. Mm-hmm. So their actual cost of production at the time, oil was forty dollars a barrel. Their cost of production was eighty dollars a barrel. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and and they had some other technical problems. They had some odor problems, and they ultimately they went bankrupt. And this was presented in in Discover as the solution. And if you follow these companies, that story is very very common. If you follow these companies, Range Fuels has done the same thing. They came out, they've made all these promises, and ultimately they, they shut their doors. And that will be the case with most of the biofuel companies that are out there making promises. They'll get out there, they'll build their pilot plant, they will discover that things don't work as they thought they would, and then they will close down. 
So let's describe that process because we read about this all the time. Some somebody's in a lab, they develop some process, and you see a beaker of this it looks like oil. That's what it looks like anyway. And, and they they hold it up and they say, "Look, we produce this at the equivalent of uh, I don't know ten dollars a barrel or something, and and we can make this out of waste. Uh, I don't know chicken guts or something, right? And 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 we read that a lot. Tell, describe for us what happens that has to happen in order to go from beaker to 10,000, 100,000 barrels a day, what are the steps and what are the short pitfalls or, or shortcomings that you often encounter? Yeah, the scale-up issue is the most important issue because, in my experience, most uh, technologies get wiped out as they go up in scale. So something you may be able to do in the lab, you, you 90% of those lab ideas don't work, and only 10% will go on to make a, uh, a pilot plant. And... For, for lab experiments, there could be all kinds of things. Your catalyst didn't work. Your, your actual process didn't work. But let's say the process does work in the lab. In the lab, you're doing all kinds of things that are different than what you would do at a larger scale. Your, your waste products may not be a problem at all. You may have a small amount of byproduct that can be thrown away. Um, lab equipment is smaller, and so the heat transfer in that lab equipment is very different than it is as you scale up. The example I give a lot is a, is a turkey. You know, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. So um, if you cook in one turkey and you imagine an oven with the heating elements on the sides, that's one thing, and, and not everybody gets that right. You know, the turkey's too dry, it's overdone, it's not cooked enough. Now imagine taking that turkey and scaling it up to cook, say, a 1,000 turkeys an hour. Now you can imagine that the issues there are very, very different uh, than they would be in in a smaller oven. You've got maybe turkeys in the middle that would be still cold while the turkeys on the outside are burnt to a crisp. So you're trying to get an even heating distribution across this larger oven, and it's the same in a reactor. As a reactor goes from lab scale up into larger scale, as you get heat differences and, and temperature differences inside that reactor, you can make different products, different byproducts, things that you didn't want to make, not as much of the thing that you did want to make. So, uh, And some companies will skip those steps. And as you skip the steps, if you think about it, if, if most technology is getting knocked out at each step, so normally a company would go from a lab scale to a pilot scale to a demonstration scale to a commercial scale. If somebody's jumping over steps, they're greatly reducing their risk uh, or their chance of success. So what would be the chance of success if we jump straight from the lab to commercial, a big commercial operation? If you don't have, um, it, it all depends on how many uh, steps there are that are unproven. So if you've got multiple unproven steps and somebody goes from a lab up to, say, they skip the pilot, they go straight to demonstration, and the size we're talking about, let's say, you know, a lab experiment is producing a few pounds a day, let's say, and only part of the technology. A pilot plant is going to be around a barrel a day, so that's 42 gallons um, of maybe a few hundred pounds a day on a pilot plant, but it's going to incorporate more aspects of the technology. A demonstration scale is going to go up to about 10 barrels a day, and the biomass-based uh, second-generation plants are probably going to be around 600 to 3,000 barrels a day. Average corn, si corn ethanol plant is 4,000 barrels a day, and average oil refiner is 125,000 barrels a day. So we're talking about very, very different scales here. The biomass plants are going to be restricted on the basis of the uh, the energy density of biomass and the logistical challenges of bringing biomass into a into a certain area. So, if you were to go from say a lab experiment and try to jump to demonstration scale, um, your odds of success are probably ten, twenty percent because at that pilot scale, you would have learned a lot of things that, uh, in fact, a lot of times you would have learned that you don't want to take this forward. You want to stop that right there. And so, and, and then the next step of demonstration scale, you'd also learn that. So now you've compounded that. If you had a 50-50 chance even of success at the pilot plant and demonstration, well, suddenly you're down to 25% by skipping that step of piloting. The, um, you know, investors, for, for investors, the risk is far lower, but the, it, the ultimate cost will be higher. If you go through all those steps and you get a commercial process, it's going to cost you more to go through all those steps, but your probability of success is much greater, and you've got less money at risk throughout that process. 
So th- this is just generally true of, of all the companies you look at. There's somebody who's got a process, and basically we're, we're taking a fairly diffuse energy source, some, some form of biomass, whether it's corn or, or, or straw, I guess. It's, you know, maybe if there's an, a cellulosic ethanol process or maybe even algae. Does this apply to algae as well? I don't know. I mean, so, but, but the basic process here you're saying is we have something that needs to be um, cooked in some way, shape, or form, modified, transformed, chemically process we've got inputs we've got waste streams coming out we've got pieces of technology that are are need to be proven out um has this been so so do you have examples i mean i so the things i've read about um one was uh um the ones where where they're basically turning anything into oil that's one thing another are these um uh, gasification plants i've heard a lot right. about those as well what well, how, how do these actually bear out in practice i thought some of these were were up and functioning and running um some of them are, but not biomass-based. So the, the history mm. of gasification, you know, this is what the Germans used during World War II to make their liquid fuel when they were cut off from oil. Um, they took coal, and they do a process uh, where they, they actually burn. You, you can do it coal, natural gas, or biomass, and you burn it without enough oxygen to completely combust. <clears throat> so a complete combustion would be uh, coal plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. So those are not very useful for chemical synthesis. But if you only put half as much oxygen in there as needed to combust, you will instead make hydrogen and carbon monoxide. That's synthesis gas. And synthesis gas can make a lot of different things, and one of those is through the Fischer-Tropsch process can make liquid fuels, can make diesel. And so the Germans used this during World War II, and it's it scaled up. I mean, it is it is a scalable process, and they made... Uh, like 100 and 100, 150,000 barrels a day of liquid fuels during World War II for their military. In, in more modern times, South Africa, and during apartheid, when they were cut off from uh, liquid fuels, they used the same process, and today that still produces 40% of their liquid fuels from coal. Um, from, from natural gas, Shell has a plant in Bintulu, Malaysia. I've been there and seen that plant running. It's 15,000 barrels a day. And they've just built a very large facility in Qatar to turn natural gas into uh, liquid fuels. Now, the issues there are the costs are quite high. The capital costs of these plants are very high. And it is, it is easier to do natural gas than it is to do coal because the transport is much easier. And it's easier to do coal than it is to do biomass. Biomass does not perform as well in a gasification, uh, and mainly because you have these tars that form. When you cook biomass, you get this sticky tar that uh, has to be dealt with, and the energy density of biomass is much lower. So your plant that can, uh, on the same footprint, a plant can produce a lot more liquid fuels from coal than it can from biomass. So nobody has quite cracked the nut on biomass yet. There, there's companies that are building plants. In fact, I was involved with a plant in Germany called, uh, the company was called Corin. Um, the man that I work for is, uh, is a major investor in Corin, and that was their model. <clears throat> they were doing gasification to, of biomass to synthesis gas and then to liquid fuels. And the, the, the commissioning of that plant went on and on and on, and it took a very long time. And ultimately, he decided to pull out of that because the, uh, you know, he's funding the whole operation out of his pocket, and he finally got to a point, and he said, I, I just can't do this anymore. And there were never, we never identified any real knockout factors, but it was a lot of little things that you have to get right. And so um, I, I'd say that gasification holds some promise for the future, but it's, it's not at $80 a barrel of oil. It's going to be more expensive than that, where gasification of biomass could make some impact. What sort of a price are you talking about? Um, I would guess that at $120 a barrel, let's say, uh, GTL, gas to liquids and coal to liquids, can can uh, compete head-to-head with oil mm-hmm. just fine. In fact, uh, uh, Sasol, the company in South Africa, says they can compete at $40 a barrel, but then their sunken costs were at 20 So they built those plants when oil was at $20 a barrel. Uh, biomass is going to be out there a little farther, just guessing – Maybe 150. I'd say at 200 dollars a barrel, you, you're going to be building some plants. Um, but there's a lot of caveats that go in there. I mean, the, the amount of biomass available is not nearly as large as people think. Um, the, the the pool of biomass out there, the, the, what 
what gets burnt in a gasifier is not all interchangeable. So municipal solid waste is troublesome for a gasifier. Uh, a gasifier that's designed to burn wood won't necessarily burn grass. Um, so there's a lot of caveats. And a, a gasifier that's burning biomass has to be in the middle of the biomass. The biomass has to be logistically very close because the further you go out, the more labor you're paying uh, and the more energy you're paying to get it into that into that central location. And the low energy density of biomass means that uh, it's just more embedded it costs in there to ship a truckload of biomass into a facility than a truckload of coal or to bring natural gas in by pipeline. Ah, the wonders of a diffuse rather than a concentrated energy source. There are learnings there. You know, when we were at ASPO, um, Wes Jackson of the Land Institute, he also spoke, and he noted that um, this great carbon uh, liberation that's happening in the burning of the fossil fuels right now was not the biggest nor the largest carbon liberation that's happened in human history. In fact, the first one was taking the native soils that existed before agriculture started as a practice from an average 6% um, organic matter content down to 3%. So we've lost about half the organic matter from soils, which is really a way of saying we've liberated a tremendous amount of carbon from the soils. In this story that you're talking about with biomass, something that I think also escapes notice a lot of time is the idea that, well, this stuff just grows out of the ground and you just take it and you just, if you want to turn that into syngas and then liquid fuels, have at it. What's missing in that story is that that carbon that we're taking off of the land is not being returned to the soil. So it's somewhere in this equation, if we're going to do this sustainably, we also have to allow for some of the grown crops to be harvested back into the soils, as it were, to maintain the organic content or we're going to be just strip mining the soil. So there's there's even other considerations here that that really um, I've I think what did Woody Allen say? You know, um, you can have great optimism ab about a problem until you understand it, or something close to that. Um, you know, things there's complexities in here. So so what I hear you saying is that um, when we try and operate at scale, we have these plants, and there's all kinds of things that bite you from unproven technologies that need to be worked out, from waste products that might build up that you hadn't expected, from incomplete reactions cycles that are problematic to fix, which give us things we hadn't quite intended to produce, which now are things we have to deal with from um, relatively uh, diffuse energy sources that are going to, by necessity, mean we are going to be getting less out of a plant on a footprint basis than we did out of prior plants. All of these things are actually considerations that exist in the real world. Did I miss anything? Uh, no, that's all correct. Um... You know, just looking at the scale, you know, you think about replacing all this all this oil that we use with biomass. Nobody anywhere is saying they think that they'll have a biomass plant anywhere close to the size of an oil refinery. So then you get into a situation where you have numerous of these biomass-based plants. So we're talking about an, an enormous scale-up scale of these things and a rollout to uh, displace the oil we use. But the other problem is if you do the math and you just, you know, make some assumptions about biomass availability and, and conversion and so forth, you'd come to a conclusion that we're never going to realistically replace more than maybe maybe 10% of the oil we use with biomass-based uh, energy, well, with, with biomass-based liquid fuels, let's say. Well, so, so the United States is... Um uh, I guess producing about five and a half million barrels of liquid oil fuels at this point in time, and we're burning maybe 15 um, in terms of, of actual uh, hydro, you know, oil that goes into the gas tanks. So we're talking 10 million barrels a day that would have to come from somewhere if we were going to truly be, you know, independent from imports and whatnot. 10 million barrels. So let's just put that into proper context in the in the size of these um, plants you've been talking about. Uh, I mean, you're saying if if a if a Pretty good sized ethanol refineries turning out what four thousand barrels a day, right? Right. So ten million, four thousand. Uh, there, there's quite a big gap there. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And and the these second generation plants won't be as big as an ethanol plant. I mean, corn is uh, the energy density of corn is quite high, uh -huh. uh, and the crops can be grown with very high yields all around these plants. Nobody has. I, I've I've, ever, I've never seen anybody suggest that a biomass, a second generation biomass based plant can be even that large, 4,000 barrels a day. Well, you know what's great? So when I read about some of these things, though, I, there's such optimism. So I, I so some, you know, one of the graphics that fishes through my inbox every so often, somebody says, look, if we just took this much of Arizona and dedicated it to algae production, and it's this little tiny postage stamp on the upper corner of the state of Arizona, we could solve all of our liquid fuel needs. What's wrong with that story? Yeah, the devil is always in the details. We see these biofuel processes and we project our hopes and dreams, and we don't know enough of the details. And once the details start to come out, 
Well, by then, somebody else has come out with something else. So, I mean, do we remember the hydrogen economy and how exciting that was? Mm. And, I, no, I mean, that's it's gone, and, and uh, you know, we didn't even have a funeral for it. Um, these these companies, they, they come, they're flashing the pan, they, they come out, and they make all these claims, and most people don't have the technical background to see what's wrong or to ask the right questions. And eventually these companies fade away. But there's a never-ending cycle of these companies, which is why people can be always optimistic. Because, you know, there's 10 companies right now claiming to have solved all of our energy problems. Surely one of those companies will, will really have the answer. And if you follow them, though, you'll see them. They go by the wayside, and, and but we get excited about something else and move on. You know, just algae, for instance, algae in the desert. Do you know how how much water evaporation occurs in the desert? It's it's a lot. So, uh, you know, I've been to an algae plant before, and and they he told me two things. I, I asked, uh, you know, about the viability of producing fuel from algae. He said, well, the problem is, he said, my electric bill and my water bill are both very very high, and so uh, there's a detail. So there's, you know, he, he, he's he got that's something he actually has to cope with. You know, he can't wish that away or hope that, well, if I only had wind power here producing the electricity and so on and so forth. He's got to deal with real problems, and, and that's when some of these stories start to fall apart, when you see actual details. Uh, Jotropha is a perfect example. I mean, Jotropha came onto the scene. Jotropha is a plant that grows an oil seed and uh, it's been used in Africa as a living hedge because animals won't eat it. The leaves are toxic. Um, it sprang, sprang onto the scene a few years ago, and it was going to be able to be grown on marginal soil all over the world and all these great yields, and it was going to be the crop that you know, solved all the problems. Well, the truth was it doesn't thrive on uh, – it, it, was, it was advertised as uh, thrives on drought soils. Well, it doesn't thrive at all on drought soils. It will tolerate – drought i mean not drought so as drought conditions it will tolerate drought but it loses all its leaves and then the yields that had been projected were on the high side of the yields that uh with with fertilized and heavily watered crops they took that and they extrapolated it all over the marginal soils of the world and then suddenly you start to look at the details and you see yeah this uh as 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 the real story comes out, you see why this isn't the answer that it was uh, it was put out there to be. India has invested five billion dollars into Jatropha, and there was a story last year that said they are going to lose that investment, and uh, because it just didn't produce like they thought it was going to produce. And so that is all too often the case that once you get into the details, you find out you know there there are things here that we just didn't anticipate. You know, it's it's fascinating to see that even a you know India's a, uh, got a very intelligent and educated workforce over there, um, and, and they've they've given a good hard run at that with a lot of money. Uh, what I find most often is that um, we get these press releases. I remember one came out, I think, a little less than a year ago, but might have been a year ago, where a company said, "Hey, we've engineered this bug and uh, given it a gene, and now it just excretes oil. It just it just all it needs is carbon dioxide and sunlight." Said the press release. And I thought that was maybe a little odd because I have some biology in my background, and I thought I remembered that most organisms actually have this stuff called DNA in them, and it, there's things like phosphorus and nitrogen in there. But let's grant them the idea that there's this bug that can just live on carbon dioxide and you know no nutrients. Um, and, and when I started scratching at that story, details were really hard to come by, and ultimately I did discover that what happens is – this little bug does um, create these little vesicles that fuse with its outer membrane, and it releases this this oil-like substance, a, a long-chain uh, hydrocarbon, into the water. And so what happens is you end up with an oily sheen on top of the water, and now you've got to separate those things. Um, it turns out that that the the issues of trying to scale to bring – you know, skim this oily sheen off and then concentrate it and separate it from the water. And then you still have a product that needs, you know, further refining and other pieces. It turned out that pretty much um, uh, rendered this a, a really, really difficult process to scale beyond anything other than, than an idea. But that was an example where somebody had a lab with a tiny pilot result, and uh, the press that came off of that was staggering. Uh, it was I, I had that article sent to me probably the most. Probably had 20 copies of that sent to me from various places. So, so that, in your, you've been in the business quite a while. What's the dynamic at work there, and, and, and why do we keep falling for these things? I think we just we, we hope and we believe that there that our energy predicament uh, can be solved by technology. I mean, we we have seen technological advancement in so many different fields, 
and we expect this is what we're going to see in the energy field also that uh you know you look at where computers have come over the last you know 30 years we expect that to happen with our energy production that you know the whole society is going to be running off of uh off of solar and wind power going forward but you know when you, I, I i sometimes say there's not always a neat solution to every problem because uh, imagine that we we've still got the common cold. I mean, it is still with us. That has not been cured, despite you know it being around forever. So not all problems can be solved easily, and the energy problem is one that is not going to be solved easily, in my opinion. Um, you know, the, our society has grown up on something that is uh, was was rich and abundant and and pretty easy to get to, and we're trying to replace that with something that uh, the, the energy required to get it and process it and produce it is a lot higher than the energy required to, uh, you know, to process oil. Right. So your message here is, is not that um, uh, these things can't be done, but when we do them, we're going to discover that our energy costs are going to be going up, that, that at what we understand to be current oil prices, uh, the various technologies that are currently out there in, in scalable form are not competitive at current oil prices. Maybe at much higher prices they are. Um, that's always a possibility. And the second piece would be that we're going to discover that there are throughput limitations in terms of the, the amount of available biomass itself that can actually uh, you know, feed into this process I- at some point. So we might uh, have both a supply constraint and, and upward price pressure, both of those probably combining um, in, in some form. Is that the basic message here? Yes, that's that's it, pretty much in a nutshell. Um, these uh, th- these processes that will work, maybe at a little bit higher oil price. It, it's also uh, very important to note what the energy inputs into that process is. I mean, one of these processes is like uh, oil shale. Uh, we we do. It is true that we've got maybe I don't know a trillion barrels or something of oil shale, something crazy in in Utah and Colorado. Uh, but the reason that process has never been economical is because the energy inputs into that process are so high. And so if you follow the story there, um, I talk about a, a newspaper headline from 1906 that says oil shale development imminent. Hmm. And a hundred, you know, 105 years later, it's still imminent. We're still talking about it just around the corner. But no matter what the oil price is, people are always talking about a little bit higher because it costs so much energy to process this oil shale. So at $40, it was going to take $60 to be economical. At $100, it's going to take 120 Now, if we were absolutely certain that oil prices were going up and we sank those costs in today, like the South Africans did with their uh, coal to liquids, we, we might find out that we, we can produce, coal, we can produce uh, oil shale, we can turn it into oil, if we're absolutely certain that the oil prices are going up and, more importantly, we're not using oil as our input. We're using something else as our input. Um, if if you get a big divergence between natural gas and oil, like we've got now, uh, you'll see some things. People doing some things that uh, maybe not sustainable, but maybe make economic sense. Like uh, you know, turning you, you might turn natural gas into ethanol, uh, which is what kind of what we do today. We use a lot of natural gas and we turn it into ethanol. And you say, you know, even if the energy balance on that was um, was negative net energy. So let's say you produced, uh, you, you took two uh, BTUs of natural gas to make one BTU of ethanol. You'd say, well, on an energy return basis, you'd say that is absolutely not sustainable. But on an economic basis, you'd say you might do something like that uh, for some period of time until, you know, demand on natural gas prices drives drives that up. So it's, a, you know, there are a lot of complexities here, but, the you know, the biggest ones are, uh um, you know what what kind of cost competitive with oil and what is the ener- embodied energy input into that process and that'll give you an idea if going forward at higher oil prices a particular process has much of a chance so what is what's the best process we have right now or, or are you saying that we would have to have some sort of a grab bag um, that, you know it, we'd, we'd have to try all sorts of things um, I, I think I think we're going to have a lot of different options I mean if uh, if we were in a tropical climate we maybe could you know, pull it off with ethanol. Um, we're not, and uh, so we have to look for some other solutions. I, I think, you know, your point is well taken about the uh, the soil, and that's one of the things I'm very concerned about is the, uh, um, you know, treating soil as a, as, as, you know, farming as an extractive industry. 
it, it doesn't have to be that way, and I've always thought that it would be ideal if the breadbasket of the country where the ethanol is produced also used that ethanol to make themselves a lot more self-sufficient. But they did it in a way that uh, the, the uh, corn was a lot more sustainable than it is now, so they're actually uh, maintaining the quality of the soil. You don't want to trade off your soil for you know some short-term fuels because in the future we're going to need to eat. Um, so um, yeah, that, that so so for the midsection of the United States, for the for the Midwest, maybe ethanol is a bigger part of the solution than it is for say California, where maybe you've got a gasification process there that can produce some some jet fuel and some things like that. Uh, in in Arizona, maybe you've got more solar cars and uh, or solar panels in Phoenix and electric cars there because they run uh, off the high quality of solar energy there. So there, there's not going to be one thing that replaces oil. I think it's going to take a lot of different things, and more importantly, I think it's going to take a lot less oil than we're using now. And the good news is we have dropped a million and a half barrels a day over the last five years. Uh, the bad news is a lot of that's because of the recession, but uh, it, it, it shows, you know, we do have some capacity for reducing our oil consumption. There is still a lot of low-hanging fruit, in my view. It's going to be painful as we scale down, and some of the alternatives are going to have to meet us at, at somewhere, at some level higher than they are today, and at some level of oil consumption lower than we have today, those will have to meet. Well, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing unless, of course, you're expecting, requiring, or in some way demanding that the future look just like the present, only larger. Um, you know, that's my main point in all of this is that when I say a disruption-free transition, I mean, I think some people hold the idea that as we've currently configured our lifestyle, where we live, eat, work, play, transport ourselves, all of those things, you know, requiring and, and relying on a liquid fuel system, that um, somehow we will manage to transition to some other liquid fuel system, some some form of, of biofuels in combination with electric car. You know, we'll, we'll put together all of these things. Um, in your estimation, you know, so first, what percentage uh, penetration, like how much of our transportation infrastructure right now is running already on, on what we would call alternative fuels, whether it's an electric vehicle or a um, – I'm not going to count hybrids here, um, but just a pure electric vehicle or, or vehicles running on um, – uh, biofuels themselves, and and from that percentage to get to something meaningful like um, 50%, how long would that take? Um, you know, the electric vehicles are such a small percentage that uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a decimal of a percentage, very, very small. And I think the goal was to have, uh, is to have like a million cars on the road by 2015, which I, I don't think is... Uh, uh, close to being reasonable, but Jeffrey Stiles recently did a calculation that said uh, even if we got to a million, and Jeffrey Stiles is a fellow energy blogger, he, he did a calculation that showed even if we got to the million cars, that's going to displace about 5% of the oil that would have come down the uh, the Keystone Pipeline. So hmm. it's it's a very small amount that we're talking about for a, a very long time in the future. So electric cars may scale up you know, farther out in the future to make more of a dent, but in the near term, they're not going to make much of a dent. So how much of biofuels uh, contributing today, that depends on how you want to figure, uh, you know, what, what what is a gallon of ethanol? Is a gallon of ethanol a gallon of biofuel, or is a fraction of a gallon of biofuel and some amount of natural gas that's been turned into fuel? So if you, if you, if you consider a gallon of ethanol as fully renewable, um, we're, we've got about 10% of our fuel supply by volume is ethanol. Uh, by, by energy content, it's about oh, 6 or 7%. But then if you back out and you start to back out the fossil fuels out of that and you say, well, you know, 80, 90% of the BTUs from that ethanol actually were derived from natural gas in the fertilizer, in the processing, and in petroleum and moving that around, you'd say the actual real displacement of, of oil would still be, you know, maybe five, six percent, but of fossil fuels, if you're, if you're looking at all fossil fuels, it's a much smaller percentage because what we've done is taken one depleting resource, natural gas, and used it to make ethanol, and that is not always going to be sustainable. So if you only count the fraction of ethanol that you'd say, and, and some people say ethanol is not renewable at all, I disagree. I think it's it's got some, uh, I think the energy return is above one. Some people argue that it's below one. But it's it's the amount that's above one that's really your renewable fraction. So if you said, how much of that is there in the fuel system? 
that's less that's one percent maybe or less than one percent of truly renewable fuel that's that's in the system all right and and so to go to say fifty percent uh, leaving aside whether there's enough land to do that, uh, leaving aside the idea that even the electric cars you started with um, the electricity mm, mostly came from fossil fuels itself it just it's it it uh, got burned somewhere very far away and transported through electrical transmission lines, so we don't see it that way but um uh, assuming even that our electric cars can run on on solar panels and that's all well and good, how long would it take to get to a fifty percent displacement? do you think? Um, you know, it's hard to say. It depends on um, if if you had a, a, a you know a dictator, he could force that to happen you know very quickly. But we have a democracy, and in a democracy, you have to work with the other party, and people have to agree on things, and they don't agree on anything. And so, you know, the next party could come in. You, you could have an agreement now. The next party could come in and turn that over. So, you know, things in the energy field, this is always a complaint, that we don't have good consistency for some of these long-range projects. So when you look down the line, you say, okay, to get to 50%, um, you know, if, if you had complete control of the whole system, you could, you could maybe turn that over, assuming, again, you had the electricity, you could maybe turn that over in, you know, 10 or 15 years. In a democracy, and, and what we have to work with here, it's going to take a lot longer than that. Um, you know, it may be 30, 40 years before you could get to something like that. And and the way you're going to get there, I think, is not people agreeing that, okay, this is what we're going to do. It's going to be oil, I think, getting so expensive that people have, are looking for other options. Right. So so my market force is 40, 50 years. And, and uh, in uh, you know, you go to ASPO a bunch. Where, where do you personally think we are in the in the uh, peak oil story? Um, I, we're we're right there. I mean, whether whether we're just past or just before, I, I I still think that we're right there. And that's the argument that I've always I I, I don't want to focus. I never like to focus too much on a date for the peak, mm-hmm. but rather what happens when oil peaks. And and this is something I've been thinking about since 2005. When oil peaks and production declines, there's going to be not enough supply for everyone at a certain price. Well, we don't have to necessarily wait for the peak to happen for that to happen. I mean, the, the, over the last 10 years, demand in developing countries has grown, and all of the excess capacity in the world practically is, has been used up. And so uh, 10 years ago, where you had all these suppliers that could come online as the price went up, you don't have that anymore. And so we have a lot more volatility and a lot higher oil prices than we had before. So effectively, whether you've got peak or not, you've got the effective peak. And that's what I've always talked about as peak light. And some people misunderstand that to mean, I mean, peak is going to be a light event. I don't mean that. I mean, it's like peak. It's a pseudo peak. It's it's behaving as a peak, even if this year we set a new production record. Um, next year we could set a new production record. But effectively, there's no spare capacity in the system, and so prices are, are going very, very high. And we're being squeezed in the West, while a country like uh, China, who uses two barrels a day of oil, I mean two barrels a year of oil per person, the United States uses more than ten times that. So higher oil prices impact us a lot more than they do them. So they may be able to grow if, if they get their oil consumption even up to four barrels per person per year. Ours is going to have to come way down. Because they're going to pri- they're going to drive oil prices much higher than they are now, and so if that happens, if if China goes a little higher and we go a little lower, it, it'll it'll potentially devastate our economy. But they may still be able to grow because they're starting from such a low uh, base. You know, I, it's um, I, this was a great point made at ASPO this year that that I heard was that what is the marginal utility of a barrel to, to somebody. And if it, it turns out that if I'm consuming 20 barrels, can I dial that back to 19 easily? But if I'm a farmer in Brazil and I've got a tractor I need to run, it turns out I will pay quite a bit for that oil um, because the amount of utility I get out of that tractor uh, plowing that field instead of doing it by hand is much higher than the marginal utility I personally get up here in the United States from consuming my 20th barrel instead of my, you know, just 19 so I, I think that point is well made that, that you know, in some ways the, the intrinsic value of the work that the oil can perform has a higher value in a developing nation than in a Western nation at that marginal barrel. That's exactly right, and I think that's a mistake that we have made. We've said as oil prices get higher, the developing countries, the poor countries, are going to be priced out of the market. And so it's going to be, you know, the Europe bidding against the United States, uh, you know, the wealthier countries. 
But in truth, um, the opposite has happened over the past few years. As oil prices have gone higher, it's the developing countries that have consumed more and more. And that's exactly why, because they're starting with such a low amount, it's worth so much more to them. You know, they're not using oil to, you know, run to the store and back, you know, for, for you know, a, a candy bar. They don't use it as frivolously as we do, and it is worth a lot more to them. And and it's exactly right. You know, how much would you pay for oil? It It all depends on what your other options are. So if our option is, okay, we don't drive to the store or, you know, I have to, I have to bike to work, I have to move closer to work, you know, we can do some of those things. We've got uh, discretionary oil usage. Them, not so much. I mean, you've got a lot of people who would love to spend, you know, uh, they, they, they would spend a lot more of their income than we are used to spending on oil. And that's the real danger for us, whether we're at peak, you know, five years ago or this year or five years from now, we're in that paradigm now. Well, I think we absolutely are. We look at oil prices right now, you know, at uh, 97 for WTIC and over 100 for Brent. And um, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, those are not oil prices I think anybody would have predicted five years ago or six years ago if you'd said, here's the economic growth of the world, here's the current financial difficulties, here's um, consumption in, in the West, particularly the United States. It's still declining. Uh, you would put those parameters in front of me five, six years ago. I would have not have predicted these current oil prices, but here they are. One possible indication of of supply tightness is uh, higher prices than you might expect. Well, and this was my long recession thesis. You know, I've, I've thought about this for, you know, The Long Emergency is a book that I read that really made an impact on me about how things could turn out. Mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, I paid homage to uh, Jim Kunstler with uh, an essay that I called The Long Recession. And The Long Recession says, historically what happens is oil prices get high, throw us into recession, demand goes down, and supply creeps up, and suddenly oil prices are down, and then we can recover. But when oil supplies are extremely tight, when peak oil is happening, when all these uh, developing countries want to consume more oil, you don't have that relief because new supplies aren't coming online at the rate that would allow prices to collapse and the economy to recover. So you get in a situation where we have now, even in a very weak economy, we got oil at $100. That's unheard of. And it may be that that's because we're in this new paradigm of, of potentially never-ending recession until, you know, we can really dial our oil consumption back faster than, um, say, these new guys come online. I mean, the, the, the new production comes online or these developing countries, you know, are, are using up all, all this extra capacity. You, you want to stay out in front of that. And unless we can do that, I think we're in a situation where, I, I don't see an end of the recession. I mean, I, it's hard for me to see how this recession ends if our oil supplies are now permanently tight. I agree with you. And I wanted to have this this part of the discussion around where we are in the peak oil story because it's it's really essential, I think, to put our hopes and our dreams about what we might be able to do on a technological basis with respect to these alternative fuels up against the reality of where we are in the peak oil story because because there are actual hard conditions. There are details, as you say. There are... Uh, things that we really have to consider that that are involved in going from uh, you know an idea of how we might live on alternative fuels to the reality of pumping out ten thousand, twenty thousand, maybe a hundred thousand barrels per day out of a plant, and what's really implied in that, and and we haven't really yet fully made that transition in a biomass way. With the exception of ethanol, we get a bunch out. But but really, you know, as we ran through the percentages, we see where we are in that story. We are very much at the beginning of the story of transition. And your point was, and I agree with this, if we wait for market forces to deliver that to us, waiting for the price signals of oil to deliver the correct message so that we, you know, make individual and collective decisions as businesses and individuals, that'll be decades. Um, we don't have decades before we're going to start facing a long recession, if you follow the recession thesis and how it couples to oil. So in recessions, it turns out things that were formerly possible are not possible anymore. Big capital investments, when budgets are being trimmed, that's not the time to get creative and aggressive and have what feels like a Manhattan project times a Man- Apollo project times 10. You know, some big national uh, outpouring uh, is not something we've traditionally in the United States rallied around, barring having something external like a war to focus on. But, you know, we would have to have, I think, in my estimation, some really very serious reorientation of priorities. Beginning 20 years ago would be awesome, but even today, it would have to be really, really a startling uh, 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 redirection of resources, talent, energy, ideas uh, into really ramping up our domestic alternative energy production for it to have a meaningful impact 
on our current way of life is how I see it. What do you say? Uh, yeah, and that's, of course, why so many of us are so worried, because we, we have a problem seeing that happening. And uh, it, it's like you say, if, if we had to have a major effort right now to ramp up, say, coal to liquids, you know, we, we've got, let, let's, say, let's say we don't have a problem with our coal supplies, hypothetically. Um, you're going to have a lot of resistance from people, number one, who don't want to use coal, but then where's the money coming from? You're in a very tight economy. Uh, these plants take a long time to build. I think some of them will get built anyway, but it's hard to imagine that the government is going to roll out a, a trillion-dollar effort uh, to, to, to replace a lot of our oil consumption when, when the economy is so so bad and they're trying to you know find a trillion dollars of savings even now. So this is what concerns everyone, and the uh, you know the time frame on these projects is long term. You know it's it's hard for politicians to plan long term. So you know the political uh, situation being what it is, it's it's hard for us to imagine. It's hard for me to imagine that uh, um, they're going to be a lot of help with with getting a solution out there. Exactly, I, I agree with that as well. And and we will we will wait for the for the liquid fuels emergency to come, and and then we will um and then we'll respond. But I think our solution set will be smaller and and less um, favorable than it would have been, say, ten years ago. It just it's uh, I see that we're, we're in a shrinking environment, so we better get busy quick. And uh, you know, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I always enjoy your writing. How can uh, people follow you and and uh, read your writing as it comes out? Uh, yeah, I've got uh, my my regular blog is R Squared Energy Blog. If you Google R Squared Energy or if you Google just Robert Ray Pier, you'll you'll find it. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on all those uh, all those things. And um, you know, I, I put out usually a couple of new articles a week. I've started putting out a video blog at the request of several viewers. They said, you know, it'd be nice, or, you know, while I'm eating lunch or something, if I could just listen to to uh, you answer a few questions. And so I've started doing that. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not too difficult to find. I write for the Old Drum some, and I write for Forbes some, and and so. The, the stuff is out there, but the most regular way to find me is uh, is on the blog. That's where all my columns will come out there first before they end up somewhere else. And R squared, that's all spelled out, right? Uh, yep, yeah, R squared Energy blog. R squared Energy blog. Well, there it is. Hey, Robert, this has been a real pleasure, and I hope we get to do it again sometime. Thanks so much, Chris. All right, you're welcome. Bye bye. All right, bye bye. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N.com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action.